You can always tell it's May in Southern California when you see the jacarandas everywhere. They're absolutely beautiful. One of my favorite trees, as long as it's not in my driveway or my car's not parked under it. Wonderful springtime to watch all of creation as we've been enjoying different views and different trips as a family and I hope you have too individually. Springtime usually brings a great fresh hope of new things to come and yet this spring we are seeing trial after trial in our communities and around our world. But we have the hope of the gospel, we have the hope of the Old and New Testament to remind us first of all that this world is not our final home and that God is in complete control even when so much is in chaos all around us. This morning we're going to look at not only the scriptures but hope to apply the mind of Christ even to where we live today in 2020. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time for our Sunday service. I should tell you before we pray that I'm standing here in La Mirada Regional Park in this beautiful setting and uh, just in case you're wondering I'm preaching to a tree again and uh, there is a uh, sheriff, LA County Sheriff officer over there. He hasn't seen me yet. He's uh, talking to some kids in the park so hopefully we'll keep him busy but if we get interrupted we'll have to give his testimony. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time in the scriptures today. Father, thank you for the beauty and the coolness of this weekend. Thank you that although things are exploding as a result of evil and sadness of our day, you are exploding your love and care all around us. We choose to turn to you. We want to turn to you. I pray that we will not be defeated by the evil of our day, but will rise above and even understand more of the mind of Christ that you offer us in all of these things. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Teach us now. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in Philippians chapter 2 as we've completed chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2. And we'll turn there uh, in just a moment. But I want to show you something that I keep in my study uh, that I brought along today. And it's a little bit of a reminder for me of my freedom and my freedom in Christ and my desire to spread his love around. I brought five stones with me today, five smooth stones. I often think when I look at them that uh, they are a reminder of what David chose when he sought out to fight a giant, as we read in the Old Testament. These stones are very special to me and that's why I keep them in my study because I received them and actually picked them up in a, a little beach called Palm Beach. Now, it's not Palm Beach, Florida, but I flew through Florida on my way to receive these stones. I found them in Palm Beach, Ecuador, deep in the Amazon, as my missions pastor and I, 19 years ago, flew to Ecuador to meet our missionaries and uh, we got in a dugout canoe and paddled way down deep in the Amazon to this place called Palm Beach. I remember dragging my hand in the river and uh, for a while feeling the coolness of the water and then I was reminded to ask are there any piranhas in this river and they say yeah we see them occasionally so my hand was dry the rest of the trip needless to say. But it was amazing to be deep in that jungle. And when we finally got to what is known as Palm Beach, we had some reflection and a time of meditation because it was on that beach 60 plus years ago that five men were speared to death by the Alka or the Harani as they're also known Indians and tribesmen of the Amazon jungle in Ecuador. Do you remember their names? Jim Elliott, Pete Fleming, Ed McCauley, Nate Saint, and Roger Yudorian. They were young missionaries in their late 20s and early 30s. They were graduated from Bible college and had such a call to 
meet and bring the gospel to these fear, uh, fearsome tribes people in Ecuador. And they had made contact and uh, were flying over the area several times and they dropped gifts, they actually lowered gifts in a bucket from a long line from the plane and then the natives would send gifts back to them up as they would circle and fly in this wonderful unique system even were able to hook a phone system up that way at times i saw that bucket in a airplane hangar in shell in ecuador as well later after that trip but to stand on that beach where they had lost their life and sacrificed their life trying to bring the gospel to these people was an amazing reflecting time for me and so I keep, as I mentioned, these stones on my desk and are reminded that the great price, I am reminded of the great price that many pay uh, for the very thing that we're doing now, to hear the gospel, to share the gospel, to spread the gospel. And as we read today what Paul is expressing to us and really seeking to have us understand and know the mind of Christ, it's good to remember people who take it serious. I think having the mind of Christ is extremely important for the days that we live in, not just to be a Christian, but to know how Christ desired for us to live and wants us to live. And so the passage that we're studying here today is an extremely important passage for our own application in the days that we live. I'd like to read for you the first few verses here as remember the setting. Paul is in prison. He is considering and reflecting too on sacrifice and what it means to follow Christ. And he's not beaten down by it. As a matter of fact, he grows in his anticipation of not only seeing the Lord, but seeing us who follow scripture, other Christians, the old Christians there at Philippi. He's excited for them to know what he is learning and what he knows as well. And so he, he says this after the teaching so far that we've studied. He now inserts this in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. The mindset that I'm going to teach you now, the mind of Christ should be in you, Paul says, and encourages let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the very form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The idea there is that when it came to Christ coming to earth and putting on human flesh, he did not see that as something to be robbed from. He willfully gave himself up. He will willfully lowered himself to the place where he would walk on earth. One thing to remember, especially as we study this very important passage, Christ never gave up his deity. He took on humanity, but he never gave up his deity. He was fully God and fully man. Now remember the context here is he starts in verse 5. Paul says, have this mindset. What is the mindset? That God himself, with all that he owned, with all that he's created, with all that he stands for, Jesus Christ, as God, didn't consider it robbery to step down from heaven to earth, but he humbled himself to do it. He willfully, in his mindset, said, even though I am God, the only way that I can reach mankind and sacrifice myself for their sins is to leave this heavenly place and come down and dwell among them. That's the mindset that he speaks of. That there's nothing that we should hold on to that would prevent us from serving and sacrificing, loving God and loving one another. As the men on Palm Beach did that day after they sought to reach out to these people to be the first to bring the gospel to them. If you've never read the story and the account Through the Gates of Splendor, 
and the different movies that have been made, The End of the Spear is one. You can even find some of that on YouTube now and hear the story of these brave, committed men of God. But that is the mind of Christ that Paul is talking about. This is the mind of Christ. It doesn't mean that every one of us are going to lay down our life physically and head to the Amazon. But the mindset says, I set myself aside, my desires, and I seek the desires of God. And the desires of God are always to reach other people, to love on them, and to bring them the good news of the gospel. So he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, and to step down is the idea and leave heaven for a while. But instead he made himself of no reputation. That's interesting, isn't it? People are all about their reputation, concerned what other people think of them, seeking higher places, bigger titles. But he made himself of no reputation and taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. In other words, he gave up his reputation in the heavens and took on a complete bondservant reputation on earth, just the opposite of his role in heaven. He didn't consider that something to hold on to. As a matter of fact, it simply means that his love for us was greater than the position that he held. Never giving up deity, he is still the king of all kings. But his love for us was so great that he laid it down to come into the likeness of man. And not just in the likeness of man, but a bondservant. You might recall, we talked about it just a few weeks ago. The bondservant is a description of a slave or a bond slave. It is someone that is completely subject to their master. And Jesus modeled that by being subject to our Heavenly Father. The Son of God submitted himself to the Father himself and appears as a man. And when he gets to that point, listen to what Paul continues to say in verse 8. Being found in the appearance of a man, as he left heaven, became a bondservant, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. That's fascinating. Obedience, but obedience that included death. He never once shrunk away from his responsibility. He never once asked to change the plan. He stated clearly in the garden, as you might recall, if there's another way, Father, that I don't have to drink this cup, may it be, but I will drink this cup, the cup of suffering, of course, he was talking about. Being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient. There's the mind of Christ. Even when things are tough, continue to obey. And he continued to obey, even with the suffering that was included. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There are a lot of ways to die. There are a lot of ways to be martyred. The end of a spear. But a cross was something that was brutal as well. And he humbled himself to be obedient even to the point of death on a cross. You'll see in verse 9, there's that word that we see pop up a few times in our study. It's that word therefore again. Therefore, because Jesus was obedient, because Jesus came to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because Jesus therefore followed the exact plan of God to save mankind, God the Father also highly exalted him. He looked at the mindset, the mindset of Christ, and he highly exalted him for being obedient to the plan and the love of God. To the point of death on a cross, the cross is that only sacrifice that God the Father accepts for forgiveness of our sin. And when the Father saw the Son lay his life down on the cross, 
he highly exalts him. God lifted him up. And listen to how he exalted him. It's quite fascinating in itself. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name. There is no higher, as a result of being exalted, there is no higher result of a name than the name of Jesus. He exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name. The name of Jesus that is thrown around so casually, the name of Jesus that is taken advantage of and used in vain, the name of Jesus Christ is the very name that God the Father highly exalted above every other name. And so when people take that name in vain or people use it in their mind as a curse word, they're taking the very one who sacrificed for their life and their salvation and not only mocking it and dragging it through the mud and trying to reduce it to a simple cuss word, but they're offending God himself. It's very hard for me not to be offended when I hear our Lord's name used in vain, but I have to remember that God also hears that, and God judges that. It's something that we all need to be aware of, but usually the people that are saying that have no idea what they're saying, because if you understand what Paul is saying in this passage, this one who humbled himself and laid down his life for us, has his exalted name, you wouldn't be using it the wrong way. But check this out. God knowing that, knowing even that people will uh, abuse it and use it in the wrong way, he says that I've exalted and given him the name which is above every other name, that at that same name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. You you know a short explanation of that verse? It includes everybody. No one is not counted in in that verse. Let me read it again. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Whether you are those who are in heaven or on the earth or under the earth. Nobody escapes this list. At the name of Jesus, there will be a day when that name is proclaimed very clearly for who he truly is and believers and unbelievers alike will drop and they will kneel and they will bow to the exalted name of Jesus. In other words, he's saying you will all recognize whether you use his name as a curse word or as your savior, you will all recognize that he is the king of kings and you will bow in submission to him. Did you hear that? Even non-believers. I I don't believe in Jesus, some say. I'm not bowing to Jesus. Well, you will bow. It's better to bow now in belief and receive the forgiveness of sin that he brings. But everyone will bow in heaven and earth and even those under the earth, even those in the pit of hell will bow at the name of Jesus. But not only bow, whether you confess now or not, you will one day. Because he goes on to say that every knee will bow and every tongue will or should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody on this earth will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some mock that now. Some disbelieve it. Some, as we said earlier, just use his name as a curse word. But there's coming a day that Jesus will be proclaimed from every tongue as they bow and say that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. We always have couple of different responses when I read that tremendous emptying passage, obedient passage of Christ. My first is a wonderful gratitude that I'm able to do that now, that I say with you today, Jesus Christ is Lord.
Jesus is God. Jesus is my Savior. Unashamedly, I say that. But the second reflection I have on that is a woe and a great concern for those who don't. I don't ever want to be flippant by saying to someone, well, you better say it now because you're going to say it later. That's true. But I want people to be won over by the love of God. I find it very important, as you will hear me say so often as we study Scripture together, as we are processing through our Christian journey, and as we are processing through 2020, here now as May is wrapping up, the month of May is wrapping up, we have stood together and witnessed this world getting assaulted by a virus that they're still seeking a vaccine for. We've heard the number of deaths in our country and around the world on a daily basis. We are now exposed to the killing of a man in Minnesota that has corrupt in the United States. In this county I'm standing in right now, I find some protest fires. This world is a very shaky place. Now, understand, I understand with you that we've seen some of this before. And I'm not going to question the magnitude of what happened in the 60s or even since then. But this is a brutal time. And it echoes that this is a world without hope. What kind of mindset are we to have? Some ask the question, well, where is God through all of this? We've just read, God is here. He came to earth. He has made known his plan of salvation and he communicates that through us. That's why it's so important to study the Bible and to bring other people into the study of the Bible so that everyone can hear. And as missionaries in Ecuador sacrificed their lives so that tribesmen could hear that would kill them. We proclaim this message so everyone can hear the good news of Jesus Christ that we are all sinners, but God left heaven above to save us from our sin. We could not save ourselves, but God has sent a rescue plan. And so the mindset of Christ now for each of us who proclaim to follow Christ is to say, help me to humble myself. Help me to draw closer to God. Help me to press in like I've never pressed in before. Help me certainly to look for his return, but let me be one of those that praise the name of Jesus rather than curse him. Well, you've seen video footage of me uh, hiking yesterday, actually. I'm recording this on a Saturday for our Sunday message. But I saw some beautiful creation. And he, here even in La Mirada, I'm seeing some beautiful uh, response of God again in these jacaranda trees. Just uh, incredible. But I come to this creator thanking him today. Not really fearful, disturbed by what I see, but I come to the creator thanking him and praising him for his plan that is going forth, even in difficulty. God is here. God is calling people to his side. Let's help people get there as we continue to grow. And let's praise him for his care, for his protection, for his eternal plan. Would you praise him with me as we close our time in the word today? Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm praising him with you today and each day until he returns. Pastor Mark signing off. I love you. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord.